one uh, point that might have come up from, from Larry's lunch talk. A number of people were asking, so why are there so many ordinary citizens and so few Lester's, maybe a declining share of Lester's? And I was walking the hallways of the law school and I saw a bumper sticker which I think explains it. It said, make love, not the law review. <laughs> I, assume, I assume all Lester's make the law review. So um, we have today, I think, the uh, panel of uh, scholars of, of congressional matters that is, is about without peer. Uh, I'm going to give very, very short introductions so we can get to the substance of things. Uh, we have uh, next to me uh, Sarah Binder of uh, George Washington University and the Brookings Institution, also one of the world's leading experts on the filibuster. It is amazing. They have let her out of Washington this week. As she it's like the Super Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Norman Arnstein, who some of you have seen last night at the American Enterprise Institute, and Tom Mann of the Brookings Institution and authors of um, increasingly depressing books that was discussed last night, waiting for the, the, the third in the trilogy. Um, David Mayhew, in many ways the Dean of Congressional Scholars at Yale University, and John Fairjohn of New York Law School. I can barely see him down there, uh, New York University Law School. We are going to talk about um, you know, positive things, Congress, uh, the, the uplifting uh, matters. And uh, Sandy asked me to be a moderator more like Candy Crowley than Jim Lehrer. So I'm going to try to push some questions at people and see if we can have a little discussion and then turn, turn to you. So I'm going to start with a, asking Norm to give the briefest um, summary of the thesis of his, of his recent book with Tom about what's wrong with Congress, why it might not fit well into the congressional system, and how our, our, how our polarized party system has really uh, corrupted the institution. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, let me start just start by saying it's it's great to be here uh, after the we're getting over the afterglow of the inauguration uh, last week, and of course in Washington mostly what we were talking about was uh, Michelle Obama's uh, hairstyle. Uh, Republicans are demanding more cuts. Uh, I'm gonna try these out, you know, when you're on. The <laughs> This is New Haven to me. So. <laughs> uh, well, the, the, uh, the book has essentially uh, a couple of main theses. One focuses on uh, the deep dysfunction that we see in our larger political process, uh, which is certainly uh, epitomized in Congress, uh, that starts with the deep partisan and ideological polarization. <coughs> But as we suggest, it, it goes beyond uh, a polarization into a kind of tribalism. But what it has done, uh, in effect, is to create parliamentary style parties, vehemently oppositional parties. And uh, as we suggest, uh, vehemently oppositional parties work fine in a parliamentary system. You can have a minority party that bitterly opposes everything and uses every tool at its disposal to block things, but it can't. The government has the capacity to act, and just as significant, the culture in the system accepts the legitimacy of the actions of the majority, even for those who disapprove of them uh, themselves uh, uh, significantly deeply, because they know that they're going to have an opportunity uh, to judge them uh, at a subsequent point. Uh, but it doesn't work either in the system or the culture of the United States. And you could see uh, both parts of that, really, in the first uh, uh, two years and then uh, the second two years of the Obama administration. The first two years where there was some capacity of a majority which had all the reins of power to act, although with the interesting twist that nowadays you can't act with simple majorities. You have a 60-vote hurdle used uh, routinely in the Senate, which is a topic that has been raised before and that we will no doubt come back to. But those actions that were taken, because they were taken by a majority over the vehement opposition of the minority, without some larger consensus uh, across leaders uh, 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 in a broad range, uh, the legitimacy was not accepted by a substantial share of the public, much less the actors in the minority. And they used every weapon at their disposal to delegitimize those actions uh, and to uh, keep them from being implemented, uh, getting down to uh, what we uh, called, that was Tom's phrase, the new nullification, uh, which included uh, blocking any well-qualified nominee uh, with the expression, yes, this person is perfectly well-qualified, there are no moral questions, but we do not want to fill a position of 
uh, the Center for Medicare, head of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which would implement the Affordable Care Act, the head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, because we don't like those laws. And then you get to uh, the real nightmare, which is a minority party operating as a parliamentary minority with divided government, where you end up with not necessarily complete gridlock, but the closest equivalent to it that we have seen. And we saw that with the fewest uh, number of laws uh, enacted in modern times. Now, numbers are not all that matter. Uh, you can view the quality of laws. The infamous um, and unfairly maligned in many ways 80th do-nothing Republican Congress that Harry Truman ran against uh, passed uh, the Marshall Plan. Any Congress that passed and enacted one bill and it was the Marshall Plan would go down in history as one of the handful of the greatest uh, achievements of the 20th century. The equivalent of the Marshall Plan in the 112th Congress uh, was the shutdown or the uh, uh, fiasco over the debt limit that resulted in the first downgrade of US credit in history. And about 40 of the just under 240 laws enacted were naming of post offices or other uh, very trivial things. Uh, the second part of the book, uh, which uh, Tom uh, rather mildly discussed uh, last night, uh, is that the, the uh, polarization and the nature of these parties is uh, asymmetric. And you don't have to just rely on uh, Tom's uh, eloquent discussion of it. You can look at data, which really do show that if you use the uh, admittedly tired old football field analogy, uh, we've had uh, two parties that for a long time had most of their members congregated somewhere near the midfield stripe. Uh, by the data, the Democrats have moved uh, probably with a larger number down around the 25 or 30 yard line. I would posit even after the inaugural speech that Barack Obama is more at the 40. And the Republicans are uh, largely uh, behind their own goalposts. Uh, <laughs> and if we took that analogy to the old uh, RFK Stadium, not a few floating in the Anacostia River uh, nearby. Um, so there's a dramatic change. And, uh, and the focus now is more on the Republican Party. We uh, emphasize that uh, Democrats are not angels here. Uh, and as some of the discussion this morning and otherwise uh, has taken place, but the movement has been more in one direction. And I, I would uh, just add, there are a couple of other elements here that are worth uh, uh, pondering as we go through this. One is, it was also alluded to this morning, very dramatic uh, difference between the Senate and the House that you saw in the reactions to the fiscal cliff. Uh, when you get 89 senators ultimately voting for a package, and those 89 include 90% plus of Senate Republicans, and they include Pat Toomey, Jim Inhofe, uh, Tom Coburn, some of the most conservative members. And this package goes to the House and you can barely get a third of the House Republicans. It tells you there's a dramatic difference in outlook and dynamic, which is very important for governing ahead. The second is if you look at the third uh, versus the two thirds of Republicans who voted for and against, there is a dramatic regional difference. The Southern Republicans all voted against. The Northern Republican and non-Southern were split. So what we're seeing is what used to be um, a fact of life in Congress. The Democratic Party had, for a long time, roughly equal parts of Southern and non-Southern Democrats with significant ideological differences, but it pushed them towards the center. Now it's a Republican Party which has its dominant base in the South, and they just look at the world very differently than non-Southern. Thank you, Norm. I'm going to turn to David Mayhew. Uh, I've got a question for him. I, I also want to hear his opening uh, remarks. But the question really is, you've written about divided government in the past and how it actually seems more productive than, than people might think uh, in an earlier era. Given our polarized parties, given where we are today, is that, is that still true? Um, let me talk sideways to that by, by elaborating what, first of all, I'll get the mic here. Is that OK? Is it working? By elaborating what what uh, what Noam had to say a little bit at the beginning of Noam's talk, I uh, I came with three with three points. This will be one. Maybe you all get to say the other two. I, I think a problem is the as Noam did the presumptuousness of the congressional parties these days. In the, in the, they they want to rule alone. A congressional party, each party in either house wants wants to ignore or count at zero the other party if that's possible. 
and sometimes to traduce the views and the interests of the media and member of the, of the chamber by not letting things come to the fore, by preventing cross-party coalitions, sometimes by waterboarding their own members into cross-party <coughs> positions as things do get to the fore. I don't think that all this is a good, a good thing. What we're seeing is an, an effort, the most strenuous effort we've seen ever, perhaps, or at least in a long time, of maximalist party rule on Capitol Hill in each of the houses, by each of the parties. <coughs> it's Harry Reid on one side, won't bring things to the floor. It's the Republicans on the other side, the Hastert rule, which was just violated two or three weeks ago, by, under which things could not be, the, be brought to the floor by the Republicans in the House, unless both, put, most people in the caucus wanted them. Now, all this, the exaggeration of this is quite new. It's quite new. It's a cross-party lawmaking, cross-party lawmaking, by one test or another, has been very ordinary in American history. It's been commonplace. It's been traditional. I want to give you some instances of it. I went looking back through laws of the last 70 years or so with this um, idea in my head. And here are some, here are some, here, here are some, some sets of laws enacted in the in the last 70 years, which exhibit one or another kind of cross-party pattern in lawmaking. I picked out some exemplary ones, some important ones. First of all is a category of laws in which, at least some, this is all the House, forget about the Senate for the moment, categories of laws in, in which at least some members of the minority party were necessary to victory. Without them it doesn't pass. At least some members are necessary. I stopped counting after getting into many, many dozens of important laws over these 70 years. But here are some. For example, the, let's see, let's see, the National Defense Education Act of 58, the Anti-Poverty Act of 1964, Johnson's bill, the Social Security deal of 1983, the Brady bill in 1993, uh, TARP, TARP, the TARP bailout of, uh, of October 2008, the trade agreements that were put through in 2011 with the three different countries you may remember. That's one set, that's a very large set. Another set is this, laws that were put on the books, I'm looking at House roll call patterns, in which the minority party contributed a higher, contributed a higher proportion of votes than did the majority party. The minority party, in short, contributed a higher proportion of its votes than did the majority party of its, of its members, of its members, they want to see of its members, that's where we're at. Here are some instances of that. The Truman Doctrine in 19, uh, 1947, the Civil Rights Act in 1957, the very important Civil Rights Act of 1964, where the proportion of Republicans voting for it was higher than the proportion of Democrats voting for it. Uh, OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970. The Reagan Tax Cut of 1981. Uh, HAVA, which was that talked about this morning, uh, Help, Help, Help America, America Vote Act of 2002, as an instance, by, by a narrow uh, statistical uh, edge. The third subset is this one. The third set is this one. These are roles, R-O-L-L-S, the term of the trade in political science. That is to say, instances where something passed in the House, even though most of the majority party voted against it. Roles, so the majority party of the House was rolled. This is not a null set. And actually, the, the, the members of the set are quite important in the last 30 years or so. Here are some. It's not an exhaustive set. Uh, Reagan's, uh, Reagan's uh, Expenditure Cut Act of 1991, OBRA whether the Democrats were rolled. The Graham-Rudman Act in 1985. The Persian Gulf Resolution in 1991, where the Democratic majority was rolled. NAFTA in 1993, where most of the votes came from Republicans and most Democrats in the House were against it. The Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002, where the Republican majority was rolled. And finally, uh, just a, just a, just a, well, just a, a few weeks ago, the, the Fiscal Cliff Act is another instance of a, an instance of a role. These are important instruments. Now, it's harder these days across these across these three sets of kind, 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 kinds of enactments. It's harder these days for cross-party lawmaking, lawmaking to take case. There's no question about that. It still does take place. Importantly, in many of these instances, it's not much is more important than TARP, for example, in October of 2008. Although it's tougher, it's tougher, given the, the, the emanations of party presumptuousness in uh, both parties on both sides. For example, probably immigration reform has been blocked by Republican House Party presumptuousness during the last decade. There's a fair chance that a majority was available on the floor for the 
comprehensive reform in probably 06, but the Republicans wouldn't let, leadership wouldn't let it come to the floor. Now, what are the remedies for this? I think the chief remedy to party presumptuousness of this sort is the electorate. And the electorate can strike, and sometimes it does strike. <coughs> if, a, if, a, if, a, if a congressional party displeases the median voter, it can get zapped in an election, as happened with the Democrats in the midterm of 2010. It's as, any, it's, as, it's as much of a remedy as anything to what governments do in American history. But I, uh, I think possibly also uh, not exactly a remedy, but I think, well, after all, we are academics. We are academics. And one of our duties ought to be to put out explanations or accounts or visions or, of things to the public in a fashion that's pick up -able. I don't think that uh, political scientists have been doing a particularly good job on this front, that is, the, in telling us what the tradition of lawmaking has been over recent generations involving the nature of coalitions in the House. The theorizing is not that great, and the, and the, and the uh, resort to history hasn't been all that effective. That is, the, uh, a successful account of what the uh, system has been, and to some degree still is, after all, which could allow, which could sh let, to let people see how new this presumptuousness is and how, how instrumental in some instances it is, would be a good thing, I think. It's, uh, the coverage is really not very good. For example, when John Boehner, the, the speaker, did his uh, 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 fiscal, I'm talking about journalists here, did his fiscal cliff routine, you remember, uh, one or two or three, two or three weeks ago, whenever it was. I, the, the, how did the journalists cover that? Or how have they covered Boehner since then? Well, he can't control his troops, has been the, 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 the lead paragraph of many of these coverages. That's really very silly. Why should we care whether he could control his troops? Why should he care whether he could control his troops? It's what the whole House does that's, that ought to be of interest to him, and, and evidently did turn out to be finally of interest to him. I thought, in, 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 I think in getting our getting uh, academics um, uh, oriented to this, what I see as a problem anyway. Let me pick up again on um, on Norm and also on um, on, um, on um, I forgot who brought this up brought this up brought this up last night. The political scientists have a long long uh, long tradition goes back three generations, possibly six generations, of, of uh, cheerleading for maximalist parties. Capitol Hill. And uh, it should come to an end. It should just come to an end. I mean, Austin Granny's point that there's, a, in some respects, an incompatibility between maximalist parties and this presidential system and effective government um, should, be, should be told. Should be, should, 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 should be told that. The long love affair should come to an end. <coughs> so, Sarah, I'm going to turn to you and ask you, uh, I know you have some other remarks I want to hear, them, but also about the Senate. Uh, the Senate is a supermajoritarian party still, I think, after, after the changes this week. Uh, how does it fit into this polarized party world? Is it much more the, seen as the sole uh, blocker of the majority rather than just one of the things that, that in our old party system it might have been? And then also, if you could fill us in a little bit on your take on the, on the changes that were made this week. Uh, sure, thanks. Should I yep, steal this? Um, I do want to come back, I was going to say a little bit about um, causes of legislative stalemate and then a little bit about the consequences. I think the causes have been well, uh, very well covered and David has just erased some more issues I think we should come back to about how we study parties and our normative commitments and how they may get, uh, get in the way. Um, let me just say a, a little bit, just very briefly about some of the, the first evidence that we may think Congress is hopeless and then a little bit uh, more about the institutional consequences that we see in moving straight to your, um, the Senate filibuster uh, event that happened, uh, happened last night. Um, first, I think there's, I, I've always been a little uh, wary of the absolute claims that this is the best Congress ever or the worst Congress ever, uh, but I think it is fair to say that recent uh, last two years we've seen this record of Congress and the President really sort of failing to capture and do and come up with their basic governing responsibilities, by which I mean they do not pass budgets, there may be reasons for that, perhaps we should not care, they are hamstring on the debt ceiling, they can't seem to pass any, at least individually, to debate individual spending bills on the Senate floor at least, and they can't, they don't seem up to uh, addressing long-term problems, whether it's fiscal policy or something like climate change policy. And when Congress and the President does muster, do muster agreements, Congress seems only capable of half measures, half a year's spending bill. 
uh, less than half a highway bill, uh, less than half a farm bill, I think they got 20% of the farm bill, and then of course many games of kick the can that we've seen uh, two months here and three months there. We've talked a little bit about the causes of that. I want to think a little bit of the consequences of the stalemate uh, that we see here, which is first, and we see this repeatedly over the last two years, uh, if not earlier, uh, the stalemate has led Congress to favor what I think of as institutional engineering, right? If we just get the process right, then we'll come to an agreement, right? The super committee. Well, let's let's uh, tie their hands behind the back. No filibusters. Expedite procedures. A little exploding can at the end in case Congress fails. <laughs> of course, these institutional solutions, super committee, did not work. Why? Because they are the product of stalemate, right? They can't both be the product and the solution. So first, there's a sort of this faith in institutional engineering that I think uh, may be putting us on the wrong road. Second, stalemate has led Congress to favor short-term mechanisms, right, that force Congress to come back repeatedly to the same questions, right, to <coughs> revisit previous decisions, whether it's two months earlier or two years earlier. Right, these permanent solutions don't seem uh, very attractive in what others have referred to as the permanent campaign. There seems to be this near constant search for leverage that comes from frequent automatic deadlines. And of course, sometimes they reach these deadlines and they simply kick the can to reproduce those uh, deadlines again. January 1st, sequester, no one's really ready to deal with it, so they kick the can to March. Other times, I think these short-term mechanisms are really much more strategic choice right, by one party or the other. The two-year extension of the Bush tax cuts in uh, 2010, and again, the solution in 2012. This year, I mean, we this week, House debt limit uh, delay kicking the can, uh, in part because they hadn't agreed on a strategy within the House Republican Conference, but in part it seems Republicans wanted to rejigger the list of impending deadlines to put the ones where they had more leverage they perceived up front <coughs> to push off the ones they hadn't uh, agreed on. And of course, it probably goes without saying, if I were an economist, which I am not, uh, but there are probably economic costs uh, to this type of start and develop fiscal policy. So first, we see, we see this emphasis on institutional engineering. We see frequently revisiting of decisions. And then we see those many, many uh, episodes of leadership-driven uh, bargains. And of course, the, the, the clamor from House Republicans, or as David said, so the median here of the chamber, is that they feel their interests might not be represented by only having leaders, uh, leaders in the room. And finally, of course, the focus on the short term complicates Congress's ability to solve long-term problems, right? Uh, long-term health care costs, climate change. Um, for single-minded seekers uh, of re-election, that perfect policy couples short-term benefits and push off the cost of the future. But of course, long-term problem solving requires often short-term costs with the benefits in the future. And that's opposite or reverse of what members of Congress uh, seem wired for. Uh, and Tufty once called this myopic policies for myopic voters. Um, and until the parties in this context can find a way to bring themselves to adopt and to take tough votes for short-term costs, even if the benefits are in the future, I think we're stuck with this type of short-term uh, engineering, uh, which frequently doesn't reach decisions. Okay, filibuster. I, I, I did say yesterday that, you know, had they gone nuclear, had they used essentially a majority vote to cut off debate and adopt a set of rules changes by majority vote, that would have been my Super Bowl. But instead, they had a very small package yesterday. They did not go nuclear. It was as if I got the, more to me, it was like the famous Idaho potato bowl. <laughs> or the, I, I admit, I did Google from ESPN, best and worst bowl games from the <laughs> San Diego Federal Credit Union Poinsettia Bowl. It was like that for me yesterday, but whatever. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't be too greedy. Um, just to put the package in perspective, and I, we can come back to details if people want to, but it was an incremental set of changes. Some people call them meager. I think they're modest. I think we're missing some of what the, why they might be important. Just uh, four quick comments on them. I refer to this as take a little, give a little. That is, there's no free lunch when it comes to Senate reform, and that is imposed by the rules of the Senate. It requires a supermajority to cut off debate on rules proposals, which means that we rarely have 67 vote majorities to do anything that ties senators' hands behind their back. So if the majority wants something, have to give something. Yesterday, I think the majority leader got a little bit uh, easier route to put bills on the floor, but in exchange, he has to guarantee two amendments for the minority, probably for the minority leader, uh, but for the minority. Now, we can come back to whether this is a net gain or net plus for the majority or for the minority, 
Uh, but, but that's the reality of Senate rules, that unless you're going to go nuclear and do things by majority vote, then you are constrained to package deals. And even the biggest reform we've had when they essentially went nuclear in 1975, even then, they lowered the threshold to 60. Reformers were quite happy to go from 67 votes to cut off debate to 60 votes, but they had to give a little, which is that they kept the threshold for any filibusters of rules changes at 67. So even when the majority is at its strongest with the threat of going nuclear, they don't just get to take uh, in, in the Senate. So first, take a little, give a little. Second, I think the motion to proceed change that the majority got yesterday, which is to say the majority leader could push four hours of debate, brings you to a vote, up or down vote, the motion to proceed, and allows you to put your bill on the floor. I think that's consequential. I think in theory, when it is used, it means the majority party no longer shares agenda setting powers uh, with the minority, and that is a big thing for the Senate where they don't really have that. Um, third, overall, the package seems to me more leadership driven essentially a set of tools for the majority leader to make the Senate work a little faster, not efficiently, but a little faster when there's bipartisan agreement. And I, and I think most people thought, well, that's nothing, but, but it can't tell you if you listen to uh, Harry Reid on the floor, if you listen to uh, Dash on the floor, to Bill Frist on the floor, to Trent Lott on the floor, you can go all the way back to George Mitchell on the floor. This is what drives leaders crazy. Right? Because the, even when there's agreement, it can get days and days until you get to a vote. So I think these leadership-driven, housekeeping types of changes are, in fact, uh, potentially important for saving time in the Senate where they might lose it uh, more productively. Uh, finally, and maybe I'll, I'll save this one for later to keep, uh, to keep us moving on. I think it's yesterday's event here showed us the limitations of this nuclear or constitutional option or what uh, Senate folks call reform by ruling. That is, senators have to be willing to use it on the big stuff that is really changing the culture threshold, and they have yet to really, they've not been willing to do that for 40 years, uh, since 1975. And if they're not willing to do that, then they are constrained to live in this institution under supermajority rules that make, uh, as I said, daily life quite frustrating. And as we saw uh, the last couple weeks, a day in the Senate it can drag on for, for weeks. <laughs> um, but I'll stop. I'm going to turn to John, uh, and I know he has some other things to say, but if I could ask him, so so these changes, the, the Congress that we decry now, is it is it really not passing legislation that is somewhere near the median voter? Um, is Are, are the, the conflicts we have, the ones that Sarah described, of, uh, whether it's uh, over the over the de debt ceiling or over uh, budgetary deadlines, these skirmishes that we have that lead to something, does, does that all add up to something at the end? And maybe that's productive, or is that is that not a productive thing? And then I guess I want you to respond to Norm's point about the, the fault being or the, the polarization being stronger on the Republican side. Is that is that true, and is that consequential to the way Congress is operating? Well, you figured out a bunch of questions I don't know the answers to. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I guess I, I want to. I want to remember the old days, you know, so just a little bit. So when I when I worked on Congress many years ago, I was very influenced, of course, by David's book, you know, uh, 1974. But I remember one thing that made a big impression on me was a, I think it was an article by Ralph Hewitt. Was it when about Bill Proxmire's entry mm -hmm. in the Senate? Yeah. yeah. And uh, Bill Proxmire was among the first you know, to really be an outside player in the Senate, somebody who developed systematically an outside audience, really, you know, and was termed in those days in the Senate a show horse, not a work horse. You know? so, and he was considered sort of outside the inner club of the Senate, outside the norms, and, and, and disruptive in that way, not just disruptive as a person, but disruptive as a kind of model for others, I guess. So, um, but in that day, that it was a very compelling description because when you studied Congress then, it seemed like, um, to use the language of the earlier panel, that the system was set up to make compromise the easy default option, at least for bills of the kind that David wasn't talking about. That is, for the normal day-to-day -day flow of business, if you were encouraged in many ways to be a compromiser in both chambers, it seems to me. So, so we got appropriations bills all the time. It's not a problem, really. I mean, occasionally, it's a problem. But normally, you know, bills passed, you know, in a routine way. Routine bills did anyway. You know, you didn't have big blockages of appointments, and and then things have begun to change. And so, you know, and Proxmire was sort of a harbinger of it, but wasn't a cause. I mean, there was a lot of other things that 
that, I, that led to a situation in which there was much more of a multiple audience problem, an external audience problem for members of Congress and the Senate. Members of the of both chambers went home a lot more often. They were very much playing to other audiences. And so the, the, the incentives that they had to compromise, at least on routine things, seemed to diminish very systematically over the next 20 or 30 years. And of course, things were not polarized, so you didn't really notice. You, you noticed some features of it, but it wasn't a dramatic fall. Um, but uh, things that David listed were very interesting. Those were, those were big things. You know, most of the legislation were big things where there were cross-party compromises. Those were probably always pretty hard. That is, it probably always was relatively hard to get compromise on big issues, because they're big issues. You know, they're things that, that don't necessarily come up all the time. But if there's a background culture where compromise is a default, that's probably a pretty good basis on which to make legislative compromise and, and to value legislative compromisers as central players in the institution. So it strikes me that that's what we've lost. That's the, that's the bag that we have to put the cat back into. So that's what I wanted to ask about is to really challenge the panel to see if, is there a way to think about, uh, uh, going back to the crude way to put it, but I mean, recovering some of the, making, making it possible for compromise to be more of a default option than a special event, you know, that needs to have media play and, and so, so Jenny Mansbridge, in her talk, at the sort of toward the end, um, talked about the virtues of the closed door. You know that, that sometimes, you know, of course, one of the things that happened is the committee meetings were open, the markets were open. You know, so there was much more, it's much more easy for outsiders to observe what goes on in the legislative process, and that that facilitated the playing to outside audiences and to other audiences, and and it made it more difficult for people to be flexible negotiation. Is that? You know, is there pos you know, prospects in that, in that direction? That's one question. I don't know the answer to it, but it strikes me that, that, it, that unless something like more, more facile compromise is possible, then we're going to be replaying what we've been seeing lately pretty often. You know, I guess another question I have, which is a larger, higher level question anyway, which is, which is um, I, it seems to me that there, that insofar as Congress doesn't, isn't able to function very well on the sort of ordinary business. I mean, the big questions are big questions. I want to put those, I want to say they're big questions because look at what, what's been on the agenda. I mean, these are huge distributional questions. You know, that, you know, shall we destroy the welfare state? Shall we destroy the business economy by <laughs> raising taxes a lot? I mean, I mean, these are big distributional questions that are not normal, you know, questions that are asked all the time. The healthcare, shall we socialize healthcare? Yeah, that's the way it was posed. That's effectively, we're still not clear how we're doing it or how far we're gonna go, but that's, those are big questions. You know, so you kind of expect that when questions are that magnitude, where the distributional elements are so strong, people are gonna disagree. You know, and it's gonna be reflected in the political system. It's gonna be hard to get to an answer. So I don't think it's a fair test of a political system that when faced with very hard questions, or take other ones like climate change or, or what to do about long run deficits, I mean, these are questions which are hard to perceive, you know, for many people. I think they're not all dishonest. They can't see what we're talking about. You know, Paul Krugman says, there's no deficit problem for, you know, 15, 20 years. Leave it to the next generation. Other people say, oh, no, we have to solve it right away. You know, so there's, a, there's an argument about what is a real problem. So these are areas where you, it's going to be hard to get to agreement because people can't agree on what the facts are. You know, what has to be done? I think that's true in climate change also. You know, it's, it's true in many, many areas. So, so these are areas where I don't want to hold it against Congress that it can't do things. It's the routine stuff, which it seems to me is more nagging. That is, that you can't let the government run with, a, you can't fill up appointments, you know, they, you know, judicial appointments, let's say, or middle to low level administrative appointments. That, that it takes years for that, you know, for a government to be fitted up to actually operate in a normal way. That, that's, that's a problem. And, and so I think when that happens, we get a drift, and we've had this drift for a long time. Um, it's spoken of both the right and the left, depending on who's in office, but it's basically a drift towards a do-it-yourself president, you know, a president who, who after, you know, on, on some issues, he's got to go to Congress because they're big issues and you need legislation, but other issues, it's not so clear. So, you know, you, you find ways to, to run a government without as much participation from the legislative branch as you might want. Because, you, know, you know, sometimes you can get away with some participation, sometimes you can't. It's a problem, you know, because, and of course, Lawyers and legal theorists follow along with this by providing justifications for this, and they tell reasons why the president can legitimately inst institute one instrumentality after another to control the administration as opposed to congressional intervention. So, 
controlling the regulatory apparatus and other things inside the administration by executive order, things like that. Legal theorists come up with theories of unified presidency and other things justifying the, the evolution. You know, and, and, and ultimately they tell the following story. They say, this is more democratic. It's more democratic because the president is the one a member of, you know, person in the government who's elected on a national franchise. You know, so this is supposed to legitimize essentially executive control of the whole apparatus. You know, and it's an, it's an insidious justification. It's not that there's no truth to it, but it's that that was, you know, it's plebiscitarian is what it is. I mean, it's basically saying that national majority should dominate local majorities that you see in Congress. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a non-plural form of justification, and it's extremely powerful. And it's powerful right now among Democrats. It was powerful, you know, seven or eight years ago as Republicans, it'll go both ways. But the, but the agreement will be on the evolution of the theory and the justification. And so I think there's a long-term problem of Congress's place in the constitutional system. It's been going on forever, uh, sometimes faster or slower. I think it's going a little faster now. And I, you, can, you can look at the structural reasons for it. I mean, one, at one level, they're very obvious. You know, like in the Madison 51 story, you know, he wanted to use the Augustinian mechanisms, you know, like enlist ambition and service you know, to control ambition. This is a checks and balances, as I said. So that's, you know, great. And it, it, that plays very unevenly across the American constitutional system. There's one president. He has an interest in conserving his power. Sometimes he doesn't follow no stats advice, but when he does, he conserves his power. You know, there's one Supreme Court justice. There's a hierarchical court system. There's a, there's a mechanism by which the power of the federal courts can be economized. And it's very effective. So when power drifts to the courts, it doesn't come back. When power drifts to the executive, it doesn't come back. When it drifts away from Congress, whether they give it away or whether it's taken, it stays away. That's what I think. So, so I think that's a puzzle and a problem. And I think if you think, as I think, that the legislative branch, the parliament, is actually the key constitutional element in our democracy or in modern democracy, then I think you have to be nervous about that. You know, so, so that's what my worry is, is that, that I think we're, we're just in this drift. I think it's not an emergency. It's not going to happen next year, I'm sure. Uh, maybe not in 100 years. I'll be dead. But uh, I'm an optimist about stuff like that. Uh, but I mean, I think it's a, it's a concern that I, that, I, that I think is a problem with Congress. It doesn't mean Congress is hopeless, but I mean, I think we have to have hope, hope for it. So that's my... So Tom, maybe I can get you to uh, t uh, touch on John's first question, and that is, what about the, the everyday workings of Congress? Why we can't get a farm bill or highway bill or, or not, not the big conflicts? And think about the reforms that some have proposed, and I think maybe you might have pushed a little bit earlier uh, in, in your career on things like returning to regular order or some of, some of the norms of the, of the earlier Congress. Are those, is that a fruitful way of thinking about the way to reform Congress, or are we just in a very different world because of the, of the change in the party system. All good questions. I've, uh, thank you uh, to my colleagues. I find John operates at 10,000 feet, and I love it. Uh, I, and I'm, I sort of see it the way you do. I find myself agreeing. It isn't hopeless. Uh, Congress is the, the absolute keystone of our constitutional system, and it's <laughs> diminished itself and other forces have diminished it and it's seeking power elsewhere and and that's really problematic and something uh, it's something we should uh, we should worry about um, uh, I, I think the idea of moving quote demanding regular order is just uh, uh, Panglossian now there's a reason we don't have uh, regular order and there's a reason why we're we're unhappy with the way Congress is uh, is operating, and uh, uh, and it has everything to do with what's happening outside of Congress. And to imagine sort of tinkering inside uh, without, in some way, coming to grips with the the broader political environment in which it's operating seems to me uh, 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 kind of silly. It's not it's not going, uh, I think, anywhere anywhere at all. I, I was really heartened by David's, uh, David's presentation and, and uh, his argument about, about the presumptuousness of uh, the congressional parties now to legislate alone. Um, it reminded me that his first book, as, if I recall correctly, was Party Loyalty in, in, in Congress. It was a wonderful book. Uh, uh, but what everyone reads uh, 
now is Congress the Electoral Connection, which you know was this just brilliant, wonderful way of theorizing about Congress with the individual member as the as the unit of analysis and the quest for re-election is taking precedence over everything else in order to accomplish objectives and in the face of that of uh, needing to allocate responsibility and authority to other units and individuals to keep the institution whole and keep it going. I mean, that's a, you know, that made a hell of a lot of sense uh, for decades. Um, but listening to David carefully, I, I thought back to his first book, and, and I said to myself, a student of Congress today would not begin with the individual member as the unit of analysis. Uh, now, scholars have talked about, about individual members and committees and parties, and obviously all three are, are, are critical in the different periods of our history. Uh, you know, one or the other of these three elements have, uh, have tended to have a dominant role in the system. We're just right now at a party dominant uh, system, and it, uh, it, it really is problematic. It's having all kinds of consequences. Particularly, as uh, has been said many times, it's, uh, the parties are roughly even, uh, and therefore uh, you combine the parity with the ideological spread, and you have the all of the rationale you need for strategic behavior by the parties in the legislative process, which makes the permanent campaign seem sort of sweet and old-fashioned. Um, you know, it's a permanent war now. It's, it's operating every day, every day on every piece of legislation. And what's, you know, it, it applies not just to those big high stakes thing, it, it applies to the most routine of matters and you do it because, damn it, you can do it. And it's, it really is tribalistic, and it's, it's, it's quite destructive of, uh, of the process in which, uh, in which we operate. And I think trying to figure out sort of how to get out of this is really important. David said, uh, of course, the major remedy is the electorate. Uh, we count on the electorate for, for reigning in outliers, for for bringing them back to reality, but it's been, it's, 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 it's striking, and Sandy is right on this, we've got all kinds of uh, obstacles to a clear view of who you hold accountable. Who do you hold accountable in, in 2010, David, if, if your real concern is the, the well-being of the economy and the minority party has as its prime objective not letting the president grow the economy more quickly, which would then make the public happier. So they have, a, they have an incentive uh, to make the economy perform less well. It, it, uh, uh, now, some of that is genuine uh, ideological differences. Uh, uh, John made a, made a case for some pieces of it, which, which I think are you know, was a generous uh, balance uh, of, of the positions, but nonetheless, it, it's there, so we've, we've set up these really perverse incentives, and they're operating in a way that, uh, that diminish the capacity of Congress, and therefore lead to a seating of authority elsewhere, but, but also greatly diminish the, the performance of the institution. Old rules, say, regarding the filibuster,